we're just going to get set up for our next panel. Whilst we do that, please continue to share your thoughts on the final day of LEAP. It's been an incredible four days. I'm sure we have made lots of connections, met lots of new people and explored many, many new ideas. of the morning we have been in the clouds, we have been in space and now we are going back into the metaverse to explore the investment opportunities and the industry developments. Um, now for anybody that doesn't know I, I work at PwC and we actually produced a, re a report in partnership with the Dubai Future Foundation at the metaverse assembly and it highlighted a number of key areas of focus which included accelerating the adoption of advanced technologies and the exchange of experiences. Um, and one of these focus areas, um, capital, will be key. So this panel is going to explore all of that. Um, back with us today, Selwa Radwi, founder of Nukta NFT. She was with us on Tuesday discussing the link between gamers, artists, and investment bankers. Uh, and she's returning today to lead this next panel. She's a real trailblazer. Uh, she inspires the future of art for Saudi Arabia. Um, 10 years after becoming the youngest Saudi artist to have a photograph displayed in the British Museum, she launched Nukta in 2021. It's the kingdom's largest NFT marketplace and she has also secured her pre-seed funding from Middle East tech investors, Sharik Partners and Sana Bill 500, which is an incredible role model for those female founders out there. Um, Selwa is joined by Sandeep Badra from California. He's general partner at Vertex Ventures, which is a global network of operator investors. They manage portfolios in China, in Israel, um, in India, and across the US. Uh, he is also an early stage investor with about half a billion in uh, assets under management, and he invests in B2B software. Sam Lai is founder and CEO of Meta Incubator. It's the very first meta incubi metaverse incubator for the Middle East, and it provides support to Web3 and metaverse projects, both for corporations and also for startups. And Christina Hawatma, uh, founder and CEO of Scopio. Scopio is a creator, uh, creator uh, of middle class for artists to monetize their art and photography and get commissioned for over 7,000 skills in the visual arts by the biggest companies in the world. She's one of the top entrepreneurs followed by NY Finance and Scopio is a Forbes under 30 under 30 company. Please give Salwa and her panelists a very warm welcome to the stage, thank you. We could exchange you guys identities in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here physically for now. <laughs> Maybe next time. Everyone, perfect, so you can hear us all. Yeah? Yeah. So I'll be picking up my phone to read the questions. No, I'm not on WhatsApp, just FYI, before I kick off. We're not doing that today. Uh, we've had fantastic intros. I'll just do a quick one. Salwa Rodwi, founder of Nukta. We're the largest NFT infrastructure builder in the region. And I feel like I want to do a more organic intro for you guys as well, if you want to mention yourself. So Sam, Sandeep, Christine as well. Go for it. Sure, so I'm an entrepreneur based out of L LA. Uh, some of you have received a book of mine that was in the Grammys this week, which is 200 images and stories from 2020 from creators that have uploaded their work on Scopio, where we have more than 3 million images and uh, stories from people that have their profiles and they get hired by companies like Disney and Microsoft that are looking for talent all over the world. I'm happy to be here and I'm Jordanian American so this is like really cool for me to be here. Fantastic. Sandeep? Hi, my name is Sandeep. Uh, I'm one of the partners at Vertex US. We're a B2B software <coughs> investor but we also love to invest in marketplaces and uh, we think there's interesting things happening at the intersection of crypto and marketplaces and kind of here to talk a little bit about it and, and have uh, 
and I was telling Salva that I have some very spicy takes on the market uh, that I want to that I want to share with the audience. Uh, I used to be a founder many years ago, uh, uh, but have been investing in mostly in B two B and in pro software for the past decade now. Fantastic, Sam. Yeah. And so my name is Sam Lai. So uh, I actually started engaging with startups uh, when I was working for Hewitt Packer at the CTO office. And then I think after during the pandemic, I actually engaged with a lot of my actual old friends from the VC industry, but they all become my kind of crypto VC. And then they persuade me to move to Dubai last year <laughs> because when Binance moved to Dubai, pretty much the whole Web3 ecosystem moved to Dubai. And then in there, I actually I learned so much about the Web3 and metaverse space. And actually, co kind of go, go back to all my background. When I was next year, right, I was dealing with VR, AR, uh, different com uh, human computer, computer interface for 10 years ago. But all those technology was too early at that time, but now all coming back together. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that's, uh, if you guys uh, want to go to the me uh, metaverse industry, I have a lot of experience that I can share. So. Oh, fantastic. And I feel like just kicking off on that mindset and just to kick off this, start, this talk strong, how about we start with the spicy sauce? Like, well, how do you see the space? Is it real? Are we too soon? Is it all just a buzz that we're riding on? What's your take on that? Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't like to be called first, but I'll, I'll go for it. Uh, so do you, know, do you guys know who Howard Marks is? Howard Marks. Uh, he, yeah, he, Howard Marks. He's one of the, sort of the best like, you know, asset managers in the world. He has this fantastic story that he published in his last uh, investor letter. Uh, two friends, Tom and Joe, meet on the street, and uh, Tom asks Joe, what do you do, Joe, these days? Uh, and Joe says, oh, I sell sardines. It's a kind of fish, you know? And Tom says, oh, I love sardines. I'd love to buy a tin of sardines from you. And Joe says, yeah, these cost $10,000. And Tom is like, what are you talking about, $10,000 for sardines? And Joe says, oh, these are the best sardines in the world. They, they have impeccable parentage and breeding, they come from the best waters in the world and taste delicious. But Tom still says, but $10,000, <laughs> how will you eat a $10,000 sardine? And Joe says, oh, my friend, these are not eating sardines. These are trading sardines. Yeah. And, and I think that you know, part of this is sort of this story about speculation versus investment. You know, mm -hmm. I think that there are incredible use cases and in people building real businesses you know, based, on, you know, based, yeah. based on NFTs and on yeah. crypto. Yeah. But I feel like there's still so much speculation around some of these like tokenomics that has brought kind of unwelcome capital and unwelcome attention in this, uh, in this industry. And you know, as an early stage investor, we actually prefer not a lot of liquidity of mm. the stock that we invest in. We actually want to believe and for, for people to like go heads down and build for many years before they actually come out in the public markets and mm. talk about their stock. And, you know, part of this is like sort of my mission to decouple speculation from what you might be doing in Web3 or what you might be doing, you know, around crypto. And so I'm here to talk about that. Spicy? Yeah, pretty spicy. I think kicking off strong. And like your I investor think sardines are salty, not spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to you next. You, 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 have a, you have a shot at this. So maybe you could talk about how, from your perspective with investors like Sandeep, for example, and you're actually creating impact with these creators, right? And it comes from a very genuine place. And how, maybe you could talk about both sides of the table, like impact on one side, oh, speculation, oh, you guys are scams. How, how have you been managing or moderating that? I think so many entrepreneurs are excited about the metaverse blockchain and crypto as three different things. And they are because they open up new business opportunities. Uh, so today I was listening to the startup pitches and everyone was possible because of these three technologies. And they mix together and they're not necessarily the same. So of course there's gonna be innovative solutions around it when we're democratizing web two basically. And you have a whole group of people like me and you that are able to participate in Web3, right. where Web2 maybe was already so saturated before. But the way I think about it, that most entrepreneurs think about it, is how are you going to integrate your current business model and the current world that we live in with this new technology as maybe a layer mm -hmm. or an amendum, but not necessarily go and dive in the deep end of something you don't even know what you're doing in. 
And that's when you see things like FTX and some crazy stories out there yeah. where you have like young people with loads of money that are too early to have a board, you know, even though they've been given billions of dollars. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. You have to sit and think as an investor, mm -hmm. what is, do I understand what you're building? Do I understand what you're using it for? And I think you'll de-risk by a lot and you'll find way more opportunities to ch change the world that we live in and make it better for all of us instead of like creating some crazy thing that nobody knows what yeah. the person's talking about and then it like becomes a scandal. You but, know? but in order for them to start <laughs> building, they need the finances as well. So I feel like there's this thin line whether you're ready or not. And maybe we could take that to Sam and you could give some insight on how within the meta incubator scene you've been You've been seeing literally all three sides of ours. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think if you look uh, from an investor, right, you kind of grow when you're different stages. When when we first doing investing, right, what we do is momentum. Whoever has hard, we just trade, trade, trade. Find the best entrepreneur, and then we invest in it. And then when you get older, then you look at the macro economic and the macro trend of the world to see which area you want to invest, right? Metaverse may be one of them right now, and crypto. And then you move a little bit deeper, then just like some of the best investors in the world, they actually have a really simple philosophy mm. when they're looking at investing. But so, actually, when we first talking with Christina, that's actually a very interesting story. Is even uh, for, for Scopio, it actually starts with a very simple mission. It's just like, oh, I saw this kind of like uh, emerging country, picture that uh, in Instagram and, uh, and Twitter, but nobody like curating it, you yeah. know? Can I just do something about it? And somehow he, he built a very successful start out of it. So when even when I'm uh, looking at uh, entrepreneur right now, I'm actually looking for that. Is the uh, entrepreneur have a mission in mind? Is that mission really going to kind of move the world? I think mm -hmm. that actually, it will get me engaged. Mm -hmm. And then I will really start listening. Did he really spend time understand the market? Is the approach to business really logical? Then actually become a very easy investment decision. So compared to all other scams. Yeah, sure. so. I mean, in many ways, both of you guys are building businesses where you're solving a real problem, right? Yeah. In your case, it's with provenance and making sure people get paid for their creative products. For you, is to make sure that artists get their due, right, yeah. and, and are popularized. I mean, and I think that that's, that's like creating real impact for real consumers or businesses in your case. Yeah. And I think that's wonderful, right? Uh, I think that there has been a huge tide of speculation in the mm -hmm. past year and a half, which we are happy to see go away from the market <laughs> so that you know, people are actually building things that people want. Yeah. <laughs> but then have you, how would you define this transition like within, let's say, deal flow that you're getting, right? I'm sure you've received thousands of NFT marketplace. Now it's more in the AI, chat, GP. There's like certain trends that go up and down. But how do you really solidify or choose and filter within that deal flow? Okay, I mean, so within, within crypto, for instance, uh, we've primarily looked at infrastructure projects, you know, so there's obviously the layer one and layer two protocols, but right above it, basically there are these like middleware around identity or around, uh, you know, anti-fraud or around like making developer APIs easy to use. And I think we've primarily been interested in that that part of the market, sort of the nerdy B2B, <laughs> B2B, B2B bits. Uh, I think that for me personally, I'm very motivated by founders who have a personal mission to build something. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, like a big turnoff, uh, like uh, easy to understand speculation is when you go into somebody's Discord channel or Slack or WhatsApp group and there are a bunch of people talking about pumping it up. And that's when I know that I'm out because <laughs> it's kind of not what I'm good yeah. at. Uh, I'm really good at like investing a small amount of money and sitting still and closing my eyes for mm. five years before anything happens. Yeah, I think it's, it's investors like yourself that give startups like us even like a longer shot because especially in a market like this, especially with metaverse, and like we're not there yet. And I, and I hate to, I know I'm moderating the session and maybe I, I should be like all pro and I'm, I am pro, but I do feel like we're slightly early and it's an extension of our markets collectively but we need to grow into it. Let's, let's figure out the technology within the merge of our day-to-day -day before we're fully yeah. within that space. But maybe, Sam, I could go back to you and you could talk about like certain industries that you see would come up in this cross-section and the pros yeah. of that. 
because from from my point of view, actually, even some of my research friends already like they study like Chat GPT, and mm -hmm. they said they actually didn't solve any problem. It's just sure. a checkbox. But then for me, actually, what the uh, uh, kind of opportunity I'm seeing is all on NFT. Mm. It's NFT marketplace. Because two of the biggest uh, emerging area right now, a lot of projects are still really hard, are actually GameFi and SocialFi. So GameFi is just like a oh, Web2 game, but how can you put the uh, kind of the crypto elements in it, right? Pay to earn is still too much, but still the NFT, the community is actually very strong. And SocialFi is just how can you move the web to like physical event space with the digital space, with mm. also with all the digital assets, right? And all of this need to leverage the NFT marketplace to do it. And the NFT marketplace, I think more will become more uh, like, like a DAO maker. It's not just a, a, a transaction pay, it's how can you QA a good project mm. and put your community together and grow user from there, right? Mm. And, and, and now, I actually need to talk to you because I have so many projects need a place to, to list things. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and uh, for me, I actually never think anything is too early or too late. Mm. So even even in life, right? I'm much older. I have so much gray hair. I always <laughs> stay still learning like Web3 last year, but I'm still so exciting about it. I actually want to get back to programming and I will join some hackathon. Because right now, the best recruiting is not actually hire HR agency or whatever. It's that you join a hackathon yourself, and then you work with some uh, programmer, and then pick the pick the co-founder and the right. employee from there. So you know, because yeah. the technology is growing anyway, yes. the art scene is growing anyway, and then we kind of have to find that fine line. I think it's just mm. it's a very thin line that we yeah. all keep jumping on and off of. Uh, but maybe Christine, you could talk about like that that line that you are really bringing towards these creatives and like when you speak to these creatives what's their what's how do they respond to you uh, are they like oh no it's too tech techy for us how do you walk them through if you could walk us through that so i got a uh notification yesterday that one of the artists on scopio's app uploaded to their instagram and said uh you can now all find me on Scopio. This is my family. This is who represents me. Nice. And for me, I thought, if this was a few years ago, you wouldn't talk about Instagram as mm. representing you. But today, people want to be a part of communities and platforms that represent them. Mm. So a lot of people today don't think Twitter represents them, for example. Mm. And so. We have to have choice in what platforms we use depending on our morals and our beliefs. So building a, a supportive community for people around the world that are already kind of underdogs and facing a lot of criticism mm -hmm. in their society and then they come to Scopio and then they get a deal with Disney and they get thousands of yeah. views on their images. They get to connect with other people in Bangladesh or Colombia or Peru that have so much talent. So. I think it's fostering these ecosystems for people. Mm. I mean, when you talk about metaverse, it really just means like a group or like a group, like we were talking about, mm. like we could be in the metaverse or uh, like on FaceTime with your mom, you're in the metaverse <laughs> or like the CEO of Microsoft Gaming was saying, hello, we have been doing metaverse in gaming forever. Mm. It's just not called metaverse. It's just called a bad video game. Mm. That's literally what, what he said. And it's, it's really true, so I think what you're seeing is that Apple, Google, Meta, and the big companies, Microsoft, are all fighting for who's the leader in the metaverse. And so even when you look at ChatGPT, guess what? That is all PR being pumped by probably Microsoft. So we're seeing influencers, actors, celebrities all talk about this thing, and we're thinking, oh my God, it's so important, it's so mm. interesting. And <laughs> you're saying, wait, like it's not that interesting. I mean, I, my CTO installed OpenAI three, four years ago and we've been using OpenAI this whole time. Mm. It, it's not new, but our perceptions are being shaped by influencers and companies that are putting big stakes, just like we were to bring up FTX again. And it's, it's like, who is telling us what's valuable? So mm. I think, we have to be a little more careful yeah. and realize that we never before had mm. these huge influential, mm. like within one minute here, I can reach everybody at this conference by just taking, putting a post online. Literally. You know? Salva, like, describe to the audience what, what your business does. 
<laughs> because you know, I think that it's an interesting application yeah. of uh, of the metaverse, right? And talk yeah. a little bit about how you took your sort of uh, your experience as an artist to actually bring art to like other creatives in the region. Yeah, I think there's a very um, fine line where the art scene is so so passionate, and there's so much culture over there, and all of these artists had to have nine to five jobs as accountants. I have nothing under against accountants. <laughs> I'm just saying like, that's not what they wake Some up for. Some of my best friends <laughs> are accountants. Also, can you be good at math and mm. creative? Yeah, you can, <laughs> but maybe it's just not the reason you want to get up in the morning, right? right. And then they have these, these drawings in their drawers next to their bed, and right. then they wake up and they have to go pump in these numbers. And I was like, why must passionate people like that, why can they not have a space for them and be able to finance their own lives, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you see the Ministry of Culture, for example, push towards these artists to have their own livelihood. And then the Ministry of Tech is also pushing towards more efficient mechanisms across the government. And these opportunities are opening up and are like, okay, so if one plus one equals greater economy, someone needs to facilitate and mediate that, right? And then as a creator myself, there are so many artists that get exploited. Uh, rights are misused, they don't get the financial means, they don't even know how to collaborate. I'm sure you've, you've witnessed this as well. So being the infrastructure builder where we're like, hey guys, it's like a plug and play Shopify. Uh, we take your assets, we'll set it up for you. People want to buy your artwork and I specifically remember there was a comment that got to me. Fantastic artist on Instagram and someone commented, hey, how can I buy your work? And she's like, text me on WhatsApp. I was like, ouch, that hurts, why don't do that? So I feel like all of these things coming together was like a very clean uh, slate that we could kick off on and the new technology was ready for it. I feel yeah. like that was more of the transition. Do you? Sorry, I'm asking <laughs> questions. It's um, okay. By all it's means. okay, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, it's my default mode is to ask questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you, both of you guys have businesses which sort of straddle the metaverse slash crypto world with like the real world, right? Like, you know, you don't, I could, I could buy an artwork off of, uh, off of your platform, for instance, without being on Solana, right? I could just pay for it, yeah. right? Ha presumably the same for yeah. you as well, right? Do you feel like crypto only makes it very constrained and actually doesn't allow like the larger audience to actually enjoy the benefits of the platforms? And is this the reason why you guys have picked mm. sort of this way to straddle both Web2 yeah. and Web3 through your, through your businesses? Yeah, um, I think that's definitely a, a main concern today. So the, the whole point of building Nukta as an innovation-driven company is to bridge this gap. And yesterday we were having a meeting with the Animoca. I'm sure you guys know them. They're the biggest Web3 investors in the world. And they have, a, they have one of their um, head of strategy, and he's been in the scene for 15 years. And his whole presentation was about, guys, there's a lot of friction. Accept it. So if this guy who's been around for 15 years is saying friction, maybe we can give our team some, or cut them some slack. Or like, hey, not enough users. But I don't know, what would, you, what would you think of that? I see a huge difference between both sides of the market. So I feel like I have literally twins, because I have buyers and then mm -hmm. I have artists. And I'm trying to grow my customer base, and I'm mm, growing my right, artist base. Right. And I'm going back and forth. On the artist side, they love minting on Scorpio's right. app. Right. And they, because you become an owner right away, nobody can steal your work, mm. and it's copyright, and it's, yes. Yeah. And right. you want that, and they have the license, then they have the, um, the NFT, and when you look at sites like OpenSea that have like 90% of right. the market share, mm. most of them are duplicates or yeah. they're fakes, right. and they don't own the work. So people are very excited about that. They're all the beneficiaries. And then they love getting paid in crypto, it's mm. cool. I have 190 countries of people that, right. yeah. that, that are trying to like get into PayPal on their account and they forgot <laughs> their password or they're locked out or like, like people are over these weird, mm -hmm. or PayPal's banned in their country. Look at Turkey, you know, they're suffering this horrible earthquake and they can't even get money into their mm -hmm. country through PayPal. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for new ways and to participate. But then on the, the buyer side, yesterday I messaged my CTO and I was like, I want to make our subscriptions that you can buy them in crypto. He's like, nobody wants to do that. I was like, why? Like, wouldn't you want to buy a subscription in crypto? Right. No, the market's not ready that for it. That is exactly yeah. right. So you have them, or like, for example, why can't Leap hire one of the artists for the digital screens here and pay them in crypto? No, they won't do that. Yeah. 
So businesses are not ready, but they're uh, the yeah. artists are so ready. They're like that, graduating exactly high right. school, that's and these exactly are like right. third that's graders. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think supply and demand yeah. have sort of different adoption rates yeah. of crypto, and uh, it's I extreme though. It's, it's extreme. It's not it's a little bit. It's like <laughs> I know <laughs> a lot. You don't know what to do because you want to give them more activity, <laughs> but then you're like, wait, nobody's gonna buy this yet. Yeah. And so that's also like a big thing for us as investors is like if it's like crypto only, you know, from a demand side, side it just doesn't make sense because we yeah. don't think the market is as widespread. Uh, whereas I think folks who are bridging, uh, you know, crypto to non-crypto, such as your businesses, yeah. actually have real shots. Yeah. And it's at the end of the day, we also have to keep in mind that usually, at least on this side of the world, and correct me if I'm wrong, those who are investing in crypto are doing it purely from an investment perspective, so they don't want to use that crypto ideally in an art piece. Let me just use my fiat, because it's such a hassle to get to that crypto in the first place that they want to store it, you know? And then the returns they get from that, they invest back in. So I definitely see that gap, but uh, ironically, I've actually seen also a friction on the artist side, because they're worried, like, oh, the, the education and awareness needs a lot of work, and I'm glad that the four of us are collectively doing that anyway. So I really, I think, Next year, th this time next year, maybe we'll be having a slightly different uh, conversation, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and NFT projects also, depending who your network is, like if you're following somebody like Gary Vee, you wanna listen to everything that he's saying and invest in the projects that he's doing. And so it, it really depends because uh, a lot of them are bubbles and mm -hmm. they're really only a group of 4,000 people or less that are investing in a project. Yeah. And then probably like 80% are um, for coming from 80% of that funding is coming from like one person. So if they drop out, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble. So it, it's kind of weird because yeah. there's it's like bubbles still mm -hmm. there, but there are projects that are continuing to do well despite the huge downturn. Definitely. But so I, I want to uh, say something But the function on that. is the interesting because part of the so NFT. Yeah, some of the really successful project actually still existing. And uh, one of the emerging trend I see is good project also helping other good project to promote. Mm -hmm and then they share the community together. It's not like before, it's a really uh, kind of systematic process. You have a marketing firm and do marketing and I like, pump the token and sell it. Now, uh, because the market is really bad, but the investors still there, but they only work with good project and then one with good project, we talk to another mm. good project founder, say, hey, you actually really doing mm. something, then I help you. And then we share the, the community. That's actually the trend I'm actually seeing because mm. a lot of my projects are working with together mm. and sharing community and increase the value from, for each yeah. other. So. I like that you talked about the infrastructure opportunities mm. though, too. Yeah. Uh, I think kind of sometimes the boring technologies are what's the most interesting, like what's gonna be the Amazon web services mm. or Shopify. of the metaverse. Yeah, yeah Shopify. Not just, you've got a storefront. Yeah. Mm. Not just Shopify, because you talk about like decentralized ident identity uh, on the on the internet, on web free. So many of things you enable like IP mm. payment, all those things. Just like when you everybody talk about oh the the crypto exchange finance, right? Mm. Uh, finance. Mm. I actually don't want to call them a crypto exchange. They are actually the biggest payment service on earth. Mm. So pretty much the South America, like Turkey, like Middle East, a lot of people just use this as payment. I heard actually, I never been to uh, Turkey for a while, but I heard right now when you take a taxi, you actually pay the taxi driver with your Binance wow. account. Because the instant nice. crypto payment. Mm. <laughs> that's the one of the, and no free, nothing. Yeah. That's exactly why they're so big. It's not because like I'm speculating something. Mm. It's actually solving people's day to day people's mm. lives. So, you know. And I think valuations should match that. Mm, yeah. Is this solving people's li like lives? Mm. And the valuation reflects that. For yeah. example, LinkedIn, I think it's worth its valuation True. from how much business it does. Mm -hmm. And this is another example, but then, so I think maybe as an investor, like what is your perspective on this? I feel like it's all over the place. Uh, I think that fundamental valuations ultimately come from whether you're creating real value for the end user or for the customer, right? Uh, you and I get a lot of value from LinkedIn clearly, and so that's why it's worth so much. You know, I think that each of your platforms has real business models and people actually benefit from it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're helping artists find, you know, you're helping photographers and artists actually find commissions, for instance, right? Copyright, right? And you're helping people get aware of yeah. like, you know, you're curating basically, Definitely. right? And I think that that's sort of, th those are real businesses with real business models. 
you know, I think how they get valued in the fullness of time is an exercise for the reader, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, we're still figuring it out. So impact driven, basically. Yeah, how much absolutely. impact are you creating? Yeah. And what is it like specifically that makes something a metaverse company? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I think that there's just good companies and not good companies. Mm. Uh, and you know, the fact that they depend on the metaverse or they depend on crypto is just a, is just an incident. You know mm. what I mean? Like you use Uber, right? Would you think of Uber <coughs> as a mobile company? No. no. It's like a wonderful car service. It's yeah, a transportation true. service. It does rely on mobile. It does mm. rely on the cl cloud. So I think that we'll see interesting businesses that just happen to have crypto in the back, right? Uh, and that's interesting because they're creating real value for real users and real customers. I think this transition from recognizing the technology versus the use hasn't happened in Web3 yet. 100%. Yeah, 100%. and it's inevitable, but I think it just requires people like us to do more awareness around it. Guys, it's not about the tech, but what are you doing about the that's tech exactly at the end right. of the day? Yeah. How are you solving real problems How are you for real people? Real problem? So I think at that note, we'll wrap our session. We'll have like about five minutes for Q&A, four to be specific. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. I love this panel. I, I love how you all were moderators. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so, Christina, my question is for you. Um, can anybody participate in Scopio, or do you have to be a certain type of artist to, to do that? So, we are facing the most creative generation in history. Um, it is meant for anybody that has a creative skill, just like you were saying, your yeah. friend has drawings by his bed. Yeah. All of that can be digitized and uploaded. If all of you download the Scopio app, I will give you each a piece of candy. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can all download it and you can upload your work there. You can also browse other people and get inspired similar to you, how you would use Pinterest. Um, and yeah, I think it's the exchange is gonna be so different. Like maybe you don't think yourself as a photographer, mm -hmm. but you have a beautiful photo of your child that you think is valuable or of Burj Khalifa. So I think the labeling is not for today anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like we're all creative in a certain way or have something of value that we think that we wanna monetize. At some point in our life, I think we all will do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it, it really like boils down to is there something, is there a story I want to share? Does this have value to me? And do I think it has value to other people? Questions? Oh, good. Yes. Hi, guys. How are you? Good, uh, how are you? Amazing panel. Nice meeting you all. Uh, yeah. My question is, again, to Christina, uh, our Jordanian fellow. <laughs> Yay. Um, uh, so my question is, you know, um, you're, like, growing in this space, and, like, I'm, and like other platforms are growing too. Um, so how are you dealing with competition such as, you know, Dribbble, Behance? Um, yeah, because, you know, they are, they are such big platforms. So I would like to know your view on that. Yeah. Well, some people look at competition in two ways. I, some people look at them as potential partners and some people look at them as competition. I think in the artistic space, there's a lot of collaboration. So for example, we have a partnership with Adobe um, where Adobe looks for us for younger creators and more authentic voice. And so we use that to build our audience. And then you look at business model differentiation. So Dribbble is like a pay to subscribe and then you post a job. On Scopio, you're commissioning for the whole project. So mm -hmm. everything from physical installations to Snapchat filters and Scopio is managing that. So I think from end to end, none of them will actually touch payments. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to make that uh, uh, a thing. And that's really because payments were really difficult to distribute around the world. True. It's brand new that we can really pay people everywhere and not have to deal with so many uh, uh, logistical issues. So on Scopio, we can go all, all through the end, uh, end to end product. And um, also their communities are don't have the potential to reach such scale. If you think about in the past projects like Flickr that had like the world's content on it because of the ease of use is a little different than the specialized skill sets of only artists like your question. Yeah. So how can you be kind of an artist in and out? And those are very specialized for a specific group. Thank you.
for just one very last quick question. Very quick question, very quick answer, and then we're going to wrap up. There are like three other questions at the back. Okay. But the, audit, the panel will be there at the back to answer those further questions at the end, but we will need to move on. Last question. There you go. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your panel. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm going to ask a question that's a little bit off topic, but you guys mentioned it a little bit. Um, what will it take to get mass adoption on this? Like, you guys are deep into this sector. So I would like to ask, what do you think the problem is? Is it ease of uh, people getting money in and out of crypto? Is it regulation? Like, what exactly do you guys think it will take to get mass adoption on this? Okay, and a 10 second answer from each of you, go. Sam. I don't <laughs> regulation. Actually, when the regulation comes, the mass adoption will come. It's actually very anti-intuitive, so you know. Perfect. Sandeep. I think it shouldn't be about money. It should be able to, it should be such that my mother, who is like 70 years old, should feel comfortable using it. And I think that that's what gets adoption. Christina. Big tech leaders like Mark Zuckerberg are gonna give it to you no matter if you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and Stella. I think just time. I bet when you all got your first credit card, you weren't allowed to put it online. Now we all have it online. Just give it time. Perfect. Yep. Panel, thank you so much. Thank That's you. been really inspiring. There's lots more questions for you at the back sure. of the room. Uh, please give them a very warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.